Hey, when I was a, a kid growing up in the 1980s, that seems to be longer and longer ago, uh, one of my favorite television shows was, was this one, uh, The A-Team. Anybody remember A-Team? All right, all the Gen Xers are like, yes, that was an amazing show. And I love the A-Team because it was uh, action-packed. There was all kinds of action going on all the time. Uh, of course, it had Mr. T in the show, and you could see all his golden chains. You have to love anything that had Mr. T involved. And the good guys, they always won, right? So what could be better than that? They always won. And at the end of every episode, after another sweet victory, uh, their leader, John Hannibal Smith, the guy with the cigar up there, he had a saying that he would always say at the end of every show and then would cut off uh, to end the show. And here was the saying, and, and let's say this together, okay? Can we say this together? I love it when a plan comes together. And tonight we are celebrating the greatest plan that has ever come to fruition in all of humanity. This is God's plan to break in to his creation that has fallen into sin, that is broken, and to bring healing, to bring redemption, to bring forgiveness, to bring hope, and to bring, bring life. And yet it happens in such an inconspicuous way. The Son of God takes on flesh and shows up in the world as a child in the city of Bethlehem. It is so unlike the A-team, and yet this is God's plan. Bethlehem is an interesting uh, place in the Old Testament book of Micah. Uh, we get this prophecy about what will happen in, in Bethlehem, but what you need to know about Bethlehem is it was, it was just a small little village uh, it wasn't very important. If you were to go, go to the markets there, they didn't have anything that stood out from the region that they were known for. In fact, most of the people who lived in Bethlehem, they lived in sort of makeshift uh, caves. Uh, there was animals there, lots of animals, lots of shepherds and all of that. And so it smelled like camels and donkeys and sheep and the sewage that, you know, was going on through the city. And so it was a very lowly place. And this shows us something about how our God acts, that our God always steps into the ordinary. He steps into the broken places. He steps into lowliness. That's where he does his best work. Jesus was not born into a palace. He was born into a stable, into a manger. His parents were not royalty. Instead, his mom was a Hebrew teenage girl. And when his birth was announced, it wasn't to all the important people, but it was to the lowly, unknown shepherds. It was all so ordinary. It was all so lowly. Well, not a lot has changed in Bethlehem. Lots of you know that Bethlehem is located in the Gaza area near Israel. And we all know what's happening right now in Gaza and in Israel. And this is a picture that I took from a Christmas Lutheran church in Bethlehem, and it's a picture of the nativity. But you'll notice that, that Jesus is up top and around him is all the rubble, and I don't know if this is a political statement or not, but what I learned from this photograph is that Jesus first came into the mess, but he continues to come into the mess of our lives today. And that's really good news because our lives, they're messy, they're broken, and where the world says, no, it should be all about show and spectacular shirts. And this is kind of a spectacular shirt, I think. And where the world says it's all about power and authority and position. Jesus come, came seeking none of those things. Anybody know who uh, this guy is? Shoatani. He's a Japanese baseball player, and he's basically the modern-day Babe Ruth. He's the best pitcher in baseball, and he's the best hitter. Uh, one problem, he just blew out his, his elbow and had Tommy John surgery on it, but he got a new contract. Maybe some of you have heard about this contract uh, with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Anybody know how much his contract is worth? Like $700 million. Y'all to play baseball. Heck, I'll play for free. I hear they've got, you know, good food spreads before the games and all that sort of stuff. 700 million. And I found this uh, newspaper title about Ahoatani and his 
his $700 million contract. I'm not making this up. This is what it said. You can go look back. Supernatural being in the flesh, bringing us light from far away space. That's not talking about Jesus. That's talking about a baseball player. Because this is what our world looks for, right? Big and flashy and shiny and headlines. And all along the way, here comes Jesus, the Son of God, taking on flesh, showing up in human form, being born in a manger. Our world tells us this is where we will find meaning. Our world tells us this is where we will find identity, that we find it in power and position and in authority, that we find it by what our bank account looks like or how successful our career is or how beautiful the world says that we are. And yet we all have these these rocks around us, this brokenness, this rubble that comes around us and we try to push away that stone of depression or we try to throw off that, that stone of fear or we try to get rid of that stone of doubt and all along the way we're, we're buried by it again and again and it's heavy. And, and we know our lives are broken, we all do, every one of us in here and we try to move those stones in our own strength and own power and yet they're, they're still there or we try to cope with them or we try to blame somebody else for them. But the beautiful thing is that Jesus steps into our lowliness. He steps into our greatest places of brokenness. And so the, the greatest thing that we can do tonight or ever is to humbly admit our own brokenness and say, Jesus, I need you to step in. I need you to be with me. I need you to help me. Because he meets us in our greatest places of loneliness. That's what the incarnation is all about. John says it this way, the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. We've all had people in our lives that have failed at being faithful to us and have failed at loving us. Jesus will never fail at loving us or being faithful to us. And he makes his dwelling, he makes his home among us. That's what's so beautiful about Christmas. Uh, All throughout the Old Testament, when God would show up in all of his glory, people would be afraid because he's a holy God showing up into sinful people and they would cover their eyes and they would would look away and they'd be filled with fear. But the beautiful thing about the incarnation is that God has shown up in a way that he can be among us. And we don't have to be afraid. And it's not because we're no longer sinful, we are. And it's not because he's no longer less holy, but he has shown up as one of us so that he can be with us. And so while we're wasting our time finding our identity and the number of followers we have and how many likes we get, while we're wasting our time chasing our tails, looking at our retirement funds, and none of this is bad, and where we're thinking that we can find identity by stepping outside of God's word and living in our own desires and our own sinful flesh, there's this beautiful call to humility that says those things aren't working, but I can find them. I can find them in Jesus. Because there's something so beautiful about humility, isn't there? Aren't you attracted to people who are humble? Like the, the world is full, enough, full of enough know-it-alls, isn't it? It's full of enough judgmental older brothers like in the parable of the lost son. But when you're around somebody who's, who's humble, you're like, I want to be with them. It's because they reflect Jesus and they reflect his humility. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says this. He says, be humble, thinking of yourself or thinking of others as better than yourselves. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Talk about raising the bar. Like, how are we doing with that one? Though he was God... Though he was God, not a prophet, not a good teacher, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And Paul goes on to say, and he became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. If this is what our God does for us, then shouldn't our lives reflect His humility? 
Shouldn't we as followers of Jesus have lives that are marked not by power and position and authority, but with a humble recognition of our own brokenness and emptying out of ourselves and our sinfulness to say, God, we need you in our lives. In a world that says, no, you're fine just the way you are. You've got it all together. We need to say, no, I'm broken. And I need only the help that Jesus can give. And what's so beautiful about this, friends is no matter how heaping the weight of that rubble is, that doubt, that fear, that depression, that arrogance, whatever it is, Christmas is about the truth that Jesus came for you. The angel shows up to the shepherds and says, don't be afraid. (laughs) Again, because here comes holiness, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to how many people? Say it with me. Oh, I'm not very smart, okay? But I recognize that each one of us in here tonight is included in that three-letter word, all. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. The Savior, here's the deal. We all need a Savior. We can't do it ourselves. You can try. You won't get very far. This is a fulfillment of the the promise that God gave to Adam and Eve as they left the Garden of Eden, that he would not leave them in their sin, in their brokenness, but he would step into it. Jesus is the Savior. In Matthew it says Jesus means he came to save us from our sins. But not only that, he's also the Messiah. And the Messiah, friends, is accessible. The chosen one that was prophesied would be accessible to God's people. Jesus is accessible to us. But don't lose sight of the fact that he's also the Lord. (laughs) That he's coming again in all his majesty and glory this time, not as a child, but as a king to judge the living and the dead. And all that power is wrapped up tonight, snugly in cloths. In a little baby. I love how Stephen Verney says it. The light that shines in the darkness could not be extinguished by the powers of hatred, envy, lies, and death. The baby in the manger has already triumphed, right? A journey that would lead this baby to the cross and ultimately to an empty tomb risen from the dead so that we could have forgiveness and hope and life. And when we have that gift, it it doesn't mean our lives are perfect. I can't promise you that tonight. You will have questions, you will have doubts, and you will have fears. But what it does mean is that God is now with you and you are not alone in those doubts and fears. And when we receive that truth into our lives, it does something. We sang about it a moment ago. Like, who, who are you going to tell, right? Go tell them out. And who are you going to tell? And that's what happened in the lives of the shepherds. I love this. They saw Jesus, and then they went back to their fields, and all of us will be going back to our homes. But as they went, they told everyone about what they had seen and heard was exactly as the angel had told them. And everybody who heard was astonished. Because they went in humility. They went in humility, Christian. They didn't go in judgment and they didn't go with all the answers, but they went in humility that recognized that they were broken, but they had this encounter with Jesus and now their lives were changed. And here's one thing I know about the world. The world needs more Jesus. Amen to that? You can't be tired yet. It's only 3.30, okay? I need more Jesus in my life. I know you need more Jesus in your life because I see some of your posts on social media, okay? We all need more Jesus. And because he stepped into our mess, we get to step into the mess of others. Not in power and authority, but in humility that reflects the humility that our God has shown us in the sending of his son, Jesus. Here's what I know about our God, that he does his best work in our biggest messes. And so when he sent Jesus, John says, he did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. And so tonight, he did not send Jesus into your life to condemn you because you haven't been in church enough this last year. He did not send Jesus to condemn you because you have doubts about this whole Jesus thing. He did not send Jesus to condemn you because you have not given away enough money. He did not send Jesus to make you feel really guilty about your life. 
But he sent Jesus to invite you into a new life that's way better than life apart from him. And yeah, it might mean changing some things in the way that you live, but he wants what's best for us, and so we, we do that. And so tonight, we can be assured that Jesus steps into our mess to sit with us in our brokenness, to sit with us in our fear, to sit with us in our depression, and to do something about it by defeating sin, death, and the devil on the cross. And so the only thing we got to think about tonight is will I humble myself and allow Jesus to be the Lord of my life and step into my mess? I'll say it with John Hannibal Smith. I love it when a plan comes together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this incredible plan of salvation that we could never have thought up. We wouldn't have written it this way. We wouldn't have thought of it this way. Yet this is how you did it, humbly showing up in this world in the flesh, being obedient to death, death on a cross, taking on the very form of a human being as the Messiah so that we could have access to you, God. And you desire us to find new identity and new life in you and real meaning in you, not in the things of this world. They don't last. And so tonight, we bring our fears, our doubts, our questions, and we want to follow you, Jesus. We want our whole life to be about you. Holy Spirit, show us what that looks like and give us the courage and the strength to take another step. And along the way, let's declare what we have seen and heard, that others might be astonished by this incredible gift of the King. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.